morning. Good morning, Dr. Morning. Anybody know is Grace uh, joining us this morning? Is she on vacation? She's on vacation. And so, Perna, do you think it's likely she's not going to join us today? I think so. <laughs> Despite the extraordinary levels of fun and excitement that we have each week at EP Conference, still you think she's not coming? All right. I'm afraid yet. Okay. All right. So let's get going. All right, this is a 12 year old following mitral valve repair. And um, the backup pacemaker, you know, we often set a patient with a backup pacemaker, um, VVI, set at 52 beats per minute. This is from a couple of these slides are from some old DP conferences from many years ago. Um, so uh, what is wrong and how would you acutely and chronically manage this? Why don't we go to Dr. David Barris of New York, New York. Good morning, Actually, Dr. Pass. Good morning, of Riverdale, New York. Formerly of Queens, New York. Um, anyway, so um, looking at this um, tracing here, I feel like I see um, sinus rhythm at the start of our tracing, and then I see a, um, a paste beat that's coming in. It looks like it's early, so maybe we're having some under sensing. Um, and then on the right side of the screen, it almost looks like there are uh, flutter waves. So it looks like maybe an iatrogenically caused flutter. Okay. Um, I would give you half credit for this. Uh, so, uh, Look at all the tracings. Look what happens to the blood pressure and to the pulmonary artery pressure. Um, would it looks atrial, like it uh, flat lines. Right. Would atrial flutter, uh, I assume you meant atrial flutter. Would atrial flutter uh, result in that? No. So maybe more of a, like a V-fib. Right. Remember, this is a ventricular pacemaker, right? Not a atrial pacemaker. So. Right, right, right. Right. So what do you think this is then? So iatrogenically caused VFib from right. an R on T. That's right. We can see here that the pacemaker is pacing pretty much right on the time of the T wave. Also, as you astutely pointed out, this is clearly under sensing because if the pacemaker is programmed at 52 beats per minute, certainly there should not be a paced complex at a rate of about 100 beats or a little less than 190 beats per minute after the last sinus beat, right? So this is a very uh, extreme example of what is really uh, one of the potential risks of setting people in a backup mode through temporary wires. So, uh, you know, we often have this idea that when we program somebody backup, like say VVI, that this is actually safer than not having the pacemaker program. But this is an example of uh, under sensing and what can happen if you under sense that you pace on top of the T wave and cause a very serious problem. So David, uh, let's say you're on call in the ICU and this uh, happens, what are you gonna do about this uh, acutely? And then uh, uh, once you've treated the problem. So we would, um, shot, we would defibrillate with two joules per kilo. Right, exactly. And uh, then how would you, uh, what would you do about this? Uh, first of all, let me ask you a question. Why do you think it is that someone after a mitral valve replacement would have been programmed with a backup pacemaker? Are there any particular concerns you might have in someone who had a mitral valve repair or replacement? So I think you'd be um, concerned about developing heart block. So that's why you might want to set a backup rate. Right, and that's true. I mean, uh, mitral valve repairs are not uncommonly associated with heart block, um, although uh, not usually, but certainly can be. Um, okay, so you've defibrillated the patient. Now, uh, how are you gonna prevent this from happening again? Because let's say just for the sake of discussion, you do need a backup pacemaker. There were some observed 
uh, non-conductive P waves uh, in the early post-op period of this patient. And so you still, uh, you don't feel comfortable not having backup pacing in this patient. So what would you do to uh, fix Check the, the um, change the sensitivity on the pacemaker? And uh, how would you assess that? I would try to um, increase the sensitivity number and then see if I'm still able to pace. Um, no. Uh, so you're in sinus rhythm. Let's say the rate is as we are looking at here, like a rate of 75. Uh, how would you know if the sensitivity is properly set on the device? There's a First sensing of all, what, light. What rate, what rate would you set the pacemaker at in order to determine if it's properly sensing? So let's say you're in sinus rhythm at 75 beats per minute. You want to test to make sure that the device can properly sense. So first thing I would ask is uh, what rate would you, in order to, to test the sensitivity of the pacemaking wire, first of all, what rate would you set the pacemaker at? Would you set it above or below the uh, sinus rhythm rate? You'd want to set it below right. so that it's picking up. So that it's sensing and not pacing, right? Right. Okay. And then uh, how, would you, how would you determine if uh, it's properly sensing or not? So there is a sensing um, light that will show up on the pacemaker. So you could see that flashing for each beat. Mm -hmm. um, and also you'll see if, it's, if, it's, if it tries to pace, uh, if, it, if it does not try to pace, then it's appropriately sensing. So that's exactly correct. And so how would you, um, how would you then tell what the sensitivity threshold is or what is the, when we're testing the sensitivity, right, we're trying to determine what is the size of the ventricular electrogram uh, there? In other words, uh, at what level do we no longer sense? So what would you be doing to the, the number on the sensitivity channel as you're trying to determine the sensing threshold in this patient? So I believe you're going to increase the number until you're no longer seeing the light flashing or the pacemaker starts to pace. That's right. And that would basically be an indirect indicator of the size of the ventricular electrogram. And then typically we would make the device at least twice as sensitive of the, as that or decrease the number in half. Okay. Um, so uh, this is an unusual observation in a patient with temporary wires because usually the electrogram that comes off of temporary ventricular wires is usually fairly large because the mass of the myocardium is so much greater in the ventricle than the atrium. And so usually under sensing on temporary ventricular wires is very unusual. Um, and by the way, if you were unable to uh, get proper sensing, um, then probably the answer would be to just leave it off and leave it attached to the pacemaker. If you're in an intensive care unit, presumably someone monitoring the patient at the bedside would be able to make the determination to turn the pacemaker on or not at the appropriate times, if, if there was no way to uh, achieve proper sensing. But this is a nice example of how important it is to properly sense when, when thinking about a temporary or regular pacemaker. I might also add, this is one of the reasons why I do not love this rule that we have in the ICU sometimes to check all wires after a patient has come back from the ICU, from the uh, operating room. Although I understand well the potential benefit of uh, doing this, uh, if you're not careful, you could just asynchronously pace the ventricle at the wrong time and cause a serious problem like this. And I'm always worried that that could happen. So in an ideal world, we would want to check to the sensing, check the threshold. Um, we probably would want to check the threshold by uh, putting it in a mode where it is properly sensing so that it would not pace unless it knew it was not on a T wave. Um, so it's, uh, you know, if you're checking the sensitivity, by definition, you are going to pace the ventricle at least one time at the wrong time because you want to know where it's going to start, start to undersense. And so by definition, when you're checking all of these things, you are putting a PVC in that could potentially be at an inappropriate time. 
So you have to be, you always want to minimize the amount of pacing you're doing in a patient who doesn't need to be paced, particularly in an early post-op patient. Okay, this is an 18 year old who had a ablation of a pathway in the middle cardiac vein. And uh, this is the electrocardiogram that uh, happened. And I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Alawalia what she thinks uh, has happened here as to this patient. Morning, Dr. Bass. Um, so this is the EKG we're looking at. I don't know the baseline, but definitely in all the leads here, the SD segments, um, um, and like in one look depressed and in two, three um, look elevated. Um, so there is concern for uh, coronary compromise um, right. during the ablation, which led to these um, SD changes. Right, so that's correct. So this is an example of uh, an acute ischemic event related to injuring the uh, coronary vessel during endocardial ablation. Typically, we should not be able to injure epicardial coronary arteries by ablating endocardially. However, um, in certain areas of the heart, such as the posterior septal region, or in the, uh, in the coronary sinus, or in this case, the middle cardiac vein, which comes off the coronary sinus, um, we are far more epicardial than we normally would be. And so uh, the distance between the area we're delivering the radio frequency current and the coronary is much smaller. Therefore, the risk for injuring a coronary is much greater. And so uh, one needs to be very careful. And it's a, it, this is not uncommon. Uh, unfortunately, if you're ablating in the middle cardiac vein, and this is one of the reasons why when the pathway is located in the middle cardiac vein, it is uh, typically a, a very difficult ablation because on the one hand, you're dealing with the technical at, uh, issues related to getting the catheter to go into the middle cardiac vein, and you are also dealing with the potential risks. So it's very hard to ablate pathways there. Um, why would it be difficult, Neha, to deliver radio frequency current with a standard uh, ablation catheter in this area, do you think? Um, except for just maintaining catheter position, you mean? Well, yeah, that's always the that, difficult. That's always usually, yeah. usually, once you get into the vein, the catheter is fairly stable, actually. Hmm. Um, this is know. an obvious answer, so I'll just uh, share it. So the reason is that because a standard EP catheter is what we refer to as temperature control. So that means that you tell the device, I would like the tip of this catheter to reach a maximal temperature of whatever number you pick. Usually it's somewhere between 60 and 70 degrees Celsius. Um, and then what the catheter, what the system does is it increases the power delivery to achieve the temperature that you've chosen, so hence the term temperature control. Now, if you're ablating, let's say on the mitral annulus, a left-sided accessory pathway, there is uh, the entire cardiac output is passing your catheter as you're doing the ablation and is cooling the tip of the catheter. And so the catheter, in order to achieve a certain temperature, it has to give a very high amount of power, electrical power to achieve the temperature at the tip. However, if you're in an area where there is very minimal blood flow, such as in a middle cardiac vein or in the coronary sinus, where the amount of flow going over the tip is much smaller, it's actually very easy to achieve a temperature of 70, 60 or 70 degrees Celsius because there is very little cooling of the tip of the catheter. And so the catheter, the system will only need a very small amount of power to achieve a temperature that you choose. And if you would if it's studies have experimental studies have shown that if you deliver a very low power lesion with high temperature, you will not get much of a lesion. Similarly, if you have a very high power and a very low temperature, you will also not get much of a lesion. So you need both a power, a reasonable power, which means at least 20 watts of power, uh, 
as well as um, a reasonable temperature in order to make a decent uh, RF application. So typically, if we were ablating in this region where there's very poor blood flow, the options would be either to use cryoenergy, which does not depend upon uh, the flow characteristics in the ventricle or in the atrium in terms of delivery of cryoenergy. So you can deliver uh, the same cryoenergy in an area with good flow or bad flow. Uh, or alternatively, you could use an irrigated catheter as Dr. Love often does in many of his ablations. And in that case, you are providing the uh, irrigation yourself. And so you, you're cooling the tip of the catheter with the irrigants, which allows you to deliver more power. Those are power controlled catheters. You're, you choose how much power you wanna deliver. And it doesn't matter as much what the temperature is, but you always need to be concerned with those catheters. They make much deeper, much larger radio frequency lesions than standard RF current. And that's the reason why most electrophysiologists do not use that catheter with irrigation running for most of their standard ablations. But this is an area where if cryo were unsuccessful or if with regular standard RF, you could not achieve an adequate power, uh, some might use uh, irrigated catheter with a low power, maybe uh, 20 watts. But even at lower low power, there's a risk for perforation or for this outcome, which is uh, injury to a, a, a coronary artery from ablation. So. Whenever the path, and this is one of the reasons why ablation in this region, particularly in the middle cardiac vein, is associated with a high recurrence rate and are very challenging. I remember many years ago, early in my career, I had a patient I was unsuccessful. I was not able to ablate, and I sent the patient to Dr. Sonny Jackman in the University of Oklahoma, who's probably the foremost authority on ablation. Actually, I believe he's the first person to have ever done an ablation with radio frequency current. And... Um, he spent, I think, 14 hours trying to ablate this pathway in a patient of mine unsuccessfully because of, of how challenging it can be in this particular region. The patient actually had a, a, a thrombus uh, in their right atrium after that ablation attempt that had to required uh, warfarin therapy for a few months. It is, was fine, but was unsuccessfully ablated despite the efforts and see how hard it is uh, in that area. All right, uh, Perna, this is an ablation from uh, many years ago, one of my pa old patients. And um, I would ask you, uh, where is the pathway in this patient and what is happening in the tracing? Again, I'll remind you that we have to always look at the legend when you're looking at one of these tracings. So we have one, two, three, four, five ECG leads. We have a high RA tracing, distal ablation, three his channels from distal to proximal, and then uh, five coronary sinus pairs from proximal to distal, and then finally a right ventricular apical, uh, apical uh, lead. I'm looking at the surface ECG uh, first, mm -hmm. and then trying to correlate with the intracardiac catheters. Mm -hmm. um, here in the his channel, let me first take a quick look at the entire strip. So I believe it's almost in the Is it in the middle of the like strip that we start ablation? Is that what the yeah? Let me. Is? Yeah, it's it's. I'm sorry. This is a bit of a not the clearest tracing in the world. But um, when you're doing a radio frequency ablation, oftentimes it causes this sort of artifact on the tracing. Mm -hmm. That's how the ablation signal is nice and clean on the left hand side, then becomes kind of crazy. So at this point, RF is turned on, and um, mm -hmm. The person who did this uh, ablation, namely me, has labeled mm -hmm. something here at 1768 milliseconds into the uh, RF current delivery, presumably denoting some event that occurred. Okay. Um, 
So I'm looking at the his and coronary sinus catheters and I'm which are here this is a h and v and um the catheter just underneath so the catheter one after the one that's underneath his i cannot read what does it say seems like has the first retrograde v wave uh, is it C6 or six? I can't read what does it say. It's proximal maybe, proximal coronary sinus catheter that has the earliest retrograde P wave. So are we in sinus rhythm? Yes, it seems like we are in sinus no, rhythm no. with pre-excitation. Okay, so we wouldn't really have retrograde P waves if we were in sinus rhythm, right? We would have... P wave followed by QRS. So let's go through this together because it's, I, I apologize, it's not the cleanest tracing I've ever uh, asked you to review. I put. So it's not, it's not entirely fair uh, tracing. Um, one of the things I want to mention is, so this is an ablation and this is a successful ablation. Typically we always measure the number of milliseconds it takes for the pathway to go away. And that's usually because there are some uh, older data suggesting that the rapidity with which a pathway goes away with from the time you turn RF current on is a good indirect indicator of the likelihood of recurrence. Um, and anything under about two to three seconds is generally considered pretty good uh, timing. So the first thing you want to look at is the surface. And if we look on the left hand side, presumably we are pre excited here. And on this side, the pathway is no longer conducting. I think you could agree that although there isn't, the pre-excitation is kind of subtle, there clearly is a change in the morphology of the QRS from the left-hand side of the screen to the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, do you agree with that, Perna? Yes. Yeah. Uh, now, it, I, would, I would also say it doesn't obviously look like it's going from pre-excited to not pre-excited, but um, you know, the first place to always look is in the coronary sinus. And uh, what we see here is, if you look in these tracings, the A and the V look pretty tight here. And as we move a little more distal, the A and V start to separate out. And then at this point at 1768 milliseconds, we now start to see that the A and V are much more separated. You see, if you compare this A and V, which again corresponds to the P wave and the QRS, we see that the AV interval is much wider than in these uh, beads here. And um, if you look here, I think you, would, you could agree that the, the earliest V is either in the proximal coronary sinus or in uh, coronary sinus 7E. And uh, once they're ablated, you can see again, you can see more clearly separation between the A and the V. So this is uh, evidence for uh, the pathway being fairly close to this area near the proximal coronary sinus. And then the pathway, um, you know, getting, uh, being successfully ablated at least acutely. So the pathway we would say is near the, the proximal coronary sinus or first or second pairs of the coronary sinus. And where that is depends on how deeply you've placed the coronary sinus catheter in the uh, coronary sinus. Um, in this particular case, uh, I think this was close to the mouth of the coronary sinus. All right, um, let me ask uh, Sergey. This is a uh, patient who has a WPW and um, this occurred in the cath lab and spontaneously. And uh, my question to you is uh, what happened? What is this that we're looking at on the right-hand side of the screen? And uh, what is the significance of uh, what we have, what we are observing here? Good morning. Good morning. Um, so based on the uh, surface uh, EKG, although uh, I'm trying to 
uh, understand whether it's a uh, white complex or narrow complex tachycardia. Yeah. Um, the surface EKG is running at a slower speed, right? So it's hard to. Well, it's the, it's the whole page is running at 100 millimeters 100 per second, second, which is the fairly standard speed sweep speed that's used during most electrophysiology studies. Sometimes during ablation or mapping, doctors will use a little faster rate to see more subtle differences in timings. But I think most of the time we're running at 100. Again, remember normal ECG is at 25. Um, so this is four times faster than usual. So if I look at the uh, ventricular channel, um, I see that there are uh, QRSs, right? And then in between of them, I see a lot of um, um, other signals in, in um, atrial, let's say, his and, and coronary sinus mm -hmm. uh, leads, which makes me think that um, it's a, some kind of an atrial fast ridden. Um, and um, it is probably uh, it's probably atrial flutter because in the heart right in the high right atrium channel, the signals seem to be at a regular rate. I agree well, that on the first part here uh -huh. it looks pretty regular. Do you think um, it stays right? Right, and then and then it changes. Um, and over there, it looks irregular. So maybe it's atrial flutter and then goes to atrial fibrillation. Mm -hmm. um, what happened? Why is it significant? Um, so, we, so I agree, we're in atrial fibrillation. And I'll mention our the observation. You might notice that in the coronary sinus, which as you know, is recording the activity around the mitral annulus, it's interesting to note that the uh, AFib, which is very, very disorganized here, looks very different than here, right? Here, you, you actually thought you were in atrial flutter because there seemed to be a, quite a significant degree of regularity to the first part of the tracing. And yet over here, I think you would agree it's quite irregular, showing how AFib can be different in different parts of the atrium. So the left atrium is clearly in a different uh, type of AFib than the right atrium, which is interesting. But anyway, yeah, we're in atrial fibrillation in this patient with WPW. And uh, what can we say about uh, what, any significance to the findings that we're seeing here? Sergey? Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, right. looking at EP cases are my favorite. <laughs> um, so um, I'm wondering if maybe we have damaged the AV node in some way. Um, and um, uh, well, and why would I say? Let so? me ask you this. Um, so Someone has nicely measured the R to R interval here and measures it at 235 milliseconds, which is a rate well above 250 beats per minute. Do most people's AV nodes conduct that rapidly? No. Not usually, no. no. So, um, okay, so... Then the question I have for you is if an AV node can't conduct that fast, that what can what do we know can sometimes? Um, if it's a, a dual AV node and there's a uh, free entry pathway in the AV node, no? Or well, another uh, usually in AVNRT, neither pathway can conduct at a cycle length 235. What do we worry about with WPW? What are the two arrhythmias that are concerning for someone? Someone walks in your office, they've been identified to have WPW. What are you worried about? What are you gonna tell the family are the two arrhythmias that are potential problems for patients like who have this, this disease? Um, well, one of them would be the atrial fibrillation. Um, 
Uh, what because about a, what about atrial fibrillation is concerning? If the accessory pathway can conduct at a um, fast rate, uh, mm -hmm. it can cause sudden cardiac death. So what does this uh, R to R interval of 235 milliseconds tell you about the ability of this particular pathway to conduct in the setting of atrial fibrillation? That it's a high risk pathway. That's correct. And that is in fact the answer to the question, what is the significance of this finding? This patient just spontaneously went into AFib on the table and we see this extremely rapid uh, R to R or quick conduction. So typically, when you're taking a patient to the lab, you would like in every patient to induce atrial fibrillation. This was a gift and that it spontaneously occurred, but you would always like to get a fib because uh, it'll allow you to understand the risk characteristic of the pathway. And uh, although we do all kinds of other surrogate tests to assess the risk, such as rapid atrial pacing to, de to determine the so-called uh, Sperry or shortest pre-excited RR interval with pacing. Um, this is really the true arrhythmia that we worry about. And so we usually will try to induce a fib in order to determine the risk level of the pathway. This, you might ask the question, well, why would you do that if you're planning to ablate the pathway anyway? And the answer is that, um, that's true, we are trying to ablate it, but if you are unsuccessful at ablating it, you would like to know what sort of risk characteristics the patient has to live with this pathway. In this case, when you see this observation, you know that you better walk out of that lab with the pathway ablated because this patient is at serious risk for sudden cardiac death. Um, <clears throat> so, so this was like a nice gift that we got in the cath lab in that the patient um, went into spontaneous atrial fibrillation and uh, thankfully broke out spontaneously as well. All right, this is a 14-year-old who's in the hospital uh, following surgery. Uh, Dr. Obiaka, you are on call. You are in the state of Alabama and someone urgently asks, you're rounding in the well baby nursery and they say to you, we've seen this in our post uh, appendectomy patient. Would you mind taking a look at this? We're quite concerned about this tracing. Um, what are you going to, uh, what are you thinking here? Morning, Dr. Plath. Um, Morning, Ms. Oma. So looking at this, um, the first third of the strip, or the first part of the strip actually just shows uh, the curious appears to be widened, and then the, towards the last third, this is like the first strip. Uh, the curious um, narrows down, mm -hmm. um, and in the second strip, I see um, some deflections that appear to be P waves. So that may be sinus. So going back to the first half, um, the rate seems to be about um, one fifty, a little. Um, higher than 150, so maybe like 170. And it's, uh, and then it continues. So on the second strip, we also see like the first, is this a continuous strip, Dr. Pass? Uh, yes, I believe it is actually. It goes from the top and then the bottom. They are not simultaneous, so okay. it's continuous. Yeah, so we see the white, uh, the white uh, QRS morphology with a read of about 170 and then goes into a somewhat narrow complex, um, slower rate, and then we go back into that white and then we come out of it again. Um, so looking at the white uh, KRA strips, it seems to be some sort of um, ventricular rhythm. Um, so I would say um, VTAC, but then I also see these deflections that are sort of suspicious. Um, you should always be suspicious. Yeah, so I'm looking at that. Um, is this patient hemodynamically stable at the pass? Quite hemodynamically stable. And I'll just give you a quote from my very dear friend, Howard Zucker, that uh, there's a fine line between paranoia and a heightened sense of awareness. I don't know if that was supposed to be helpful, Dr. Pass. But I, it's a good question whether it was helpful, <laughs> but should you be paranoid about this or should you just have a heightened sense of awareness? Is there... <laughs> 
Are you sure this is an arrhythmia, Doctor? So I'm not sure. Like I'm saying, I'm seeing this different. Even when I look at the white before each widened QRS per se, I still see like there seems to be some sort of deflection, and it's sort of consistent. So I'm not very sure. Right. So what you would do in a case, you know, what you would do in a case like this is take out your calipers, and this is just artifact. This yeah. is somebody who's in sinus rhythm and you can almost see them, right? This looks like one of those beats. And if you look at this R to R interval or this R to this, this to this here, kind of very similar to this. Oh, yeah. Very unusual to have a ventricular arrhythmia that goes into sinus without any kind of pause. And then again, goes back into sinus. Now, is it possible that you could be having torsade that's starting and stopping, yes, but if you take out your calipers, and I apologize, I was just lazy, so I didn't, I didn't mark up the strip for this morning's conference, but I think you could argue that this, we're looking here intermittently, you pretty clearly see that there is an artifact that is probably consistent with the QRS. So this is just artifact, probably from chest physiotherapy or something like that. This is not an arrhythmia. Uh, let's move forward here to this one. Okay. So this is a six, this is a tracing from a six-year-old whose nine-year-old sister died suddenly at home. And we don't have a, uh, a good understanding of uh, why the sister died. So you are asked, the family is obviously very concerned. They have another child and you're seeing the sister. So David uh, Barris, you're looking at this tracing. Are there any abnormalities that you're observing? And if not, or if so, uh, how, what would your workup be at this point? So I'm looking at this and it looks like it's a sinus rhythm with a normal axis rate is not too high. Um, our T waves um, are, there's T waves that are up in V2, but down in V3, um, and V4 is not upright. So that well, that would be, I guess, a little bit um, irregular. Um, the QT um, looks okay. Um, PR looks, oh, maybe a little on the longer side, but nothing um, crazy. Um, no ST, um, no blocks. Um, our wave progression is fine, no hypertrophies. Um, so I was besides for that T wave um, uh, in V3 being inverted, there's not much else that I see on here. Yeah, it looks, looks fairly normal. I agree with you 100%. So what are you going to do to uh, evaluate this patient? Because we know that sometimes, well, sometimes you're lucky if you have a life-threatening condition, the electrocardiogram will be abnormal. Uh, it is certainly highly reassuring that the EKG is normal, the resting EKG, right? Like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is the most common form of most common cause of sudden cardiac death in young people, um, would normally or usually have abnormalities, which we don't really see in this tracing. But um, obviously, this is a very high stakes situation because they've already lost one child. You want to feel pretty confident that if you send this patient home with a diagnosis of normal, that you're darn certain of it. So what other testing would you do, David, in this circumstance? So thinking about our options, um, you know, there's a few things that come to mind. Um, there, there are home monitors like a ZO to make sure that there's no, um, there's, there's no changes from baseline. Um, there's an, always an echo, but as you mentioned, you know, we would probably see some abnormalities for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on our ECG, but either way, a screening echo would give us a lot of data. Um, and then I suppose, um, whether or not, you know, there's always the genetic testing, um, would, I mean, those are the options I'm trying to think okay. about what would be appropriate, um, for this patient who has a normal ECG. So, uh, ECG is normal. Holter, as you suggested, was normal with the rare PVC. Um, and uh, I should also mention, I don't know why it's not here. The echo was also normal. I agree. I would have done all the testing you suggested. Um, and then um, stress test was done. Um, in the baseline, it was normal, but there were PVCs with exercise. Uh, 
So uh, anything else you might do in this patient? So, I mean, I'm not sure if there would be- normal, uh, normal to have PVCs with exercise? Well, I know that occasional PVCs can be normal. Um, I'm trying to think if specifically with um, exercise, um, if that would be something that would be raise an alarm, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. So the concern would be um, PVCs with exercise raises your eyebrows about the possibility of catecholaminergic polymorphic VT or CPVT. And uh, this is something that I learned from Mike Ackerman at the Mayo Clinic that if you're, if you're on an exercise study, uh, most people with CPVT, when their heart rate, their sinus rate exceeds about 120, they start having a lot of PVCs. And generally speaking, um, if you see extinguishing of PVCs with exercise, with sinus acceleration, that is generally considered a good reassuring sign of safety. Um, can't hang your hat on it, but it's a pretty reassuring finding. But if you see that the PVCs worsen with exercise, that is a concerning finding in general. And so um, this patient got uh, an IV proke challenge because um, what would we be looking for, for with an IV proke challenge? What, what's, what disease are we ruling out, David, with that? Is it VTAC? Well, but what, what disease do we give procainamide to? So this is, a, in other words, this was a, uh, intentionally the patient was given a, a bolus of procainamide and sitting on the table in sinus rhythm. What is that, what is that testing done for? What uh, disease are we screening for with that? So that is the uh, standard way to look for uh, Brugada syndrome. So is a, a procainamide challenge. Now in the United States, that is the only, the only agent that we have to test for this um, sodium channel blocker. But in, uh, in, the, in Europe, they have this drug called Ashmaline, which is uh, much, apparently is, makes the test much more sensitive for the evaluation for Brugada syndrome. Sometimes, uh, you know, patients who are in Brugada, who have Brugada syndrome will not always have the classical findings on their electrocardiogram. They can uh, be evanescent and come and go, which is why when we're evaluating a patient like this, I will often ask the parents that if the child has a fever for some reason, mm -hmm. I would ask that they try to get an electrocardiogram at that time, maybe go to an emergency room or an urgent care center, or even just come into cardiology at that time because fever is a very big provoc provocateur of, um, of ventricular arrhythmia in patients who have Brugada syndrome. But uh, so we use procainamide. It's the best agent that we have in the United States. It is, according to most experts on Brugada, it's not a particularly good agent to bring out the findings on the electrocardiogram, but that is what we do. And this patient had no response. And in this particular case, uh, an EP study was started and um, they, uh, was, was performed and they gave isoprel. I would not have gone to this stage, by the way. Uh, but as you can see, when isoprel was started, the patient went into ventricular tachycardia. And um, this would be uh, highly suggestive spontaneously. This would be highly suggested of uh, CPVT. Now in the present era, this is an old tracing from uh, 15 years ago. I would have probably not done this uh, and I would have just, uh, I would have done genetic testing. Uh, I would have done a stress test. If the stress test showed a lot of PVCs, usually you don't just see PVCs in people with CPVT, you see um, runs of polymorphic VT that look like this tracing, you know, that we're looking at with uh, lots and lots of VT it can actually be quite scary. And so uh, this is why you want to have defibrillator in the room and uh, you want to have a good chair for the patient to sit down in as soon as they start having this, because this is pathognomonic for the diagnosis of CPVT. But uh, we could also do genetic testing um, as well. So we would get Dr. Gelb involved as well. Any questions about this?
Dr. Pass, is it possible to have CB, CPVT with a negative genetic testing? Yes. The testing so for CPVT is not 100% at all. In fact, I think it's, I, I apologize, I'm not 100% certain, but I think it's only about 50% positive. So if this patient had had a negative genetic test and they hadn't done this CP study with isoprene, they wouldn't have known that they had. That's correct. You would not have known that, but uh, it would be unusual. I would not have done this. I would have just stressed the patient. And the stress test is pretty sensitive. I don't know the exact figures on how sensitive it is, but it's a pretty good test for the diagnosis of CPVT. Bad CPVT patients, if you push them on a treadmill, they'll start having a lot of uh, ventricular tachycardia. Um, and that's in fact, one of the reasons why people worry about um, defibrillators in those patients. If you are in this arrhythmia, but are not unconscious, because you would not necessarily be at this rate, at least for a short period of time, and you get shocked, you're gonna be in a lot of pain and it could actually cause a VT storm because you'll get upset about getting shocked. And so there are a lot of people, a lot of experts who feel that ICDs are inappropriate for patients with CPVT because they might actually trigger a storm of ventricular tachycardia. And so what we, uh, most do not believe that. In other words, what you would hope is that you would program it in a manner that the patient would basically have, be, have fallen unconscious by the time they were shocked. Um, but you always have to be careful about this. So what is the treatment, Uzo, for someone with CPVT? I believe you can do uh, beta blockers for them. Yeah, usually high-dose beta blockade. Typically, some, a non-selective beta blocker like metalol would be used at high dose. And if that were unsuccessful, there have been reports of uh, stellate gangliectomy which has uh, been shown to be fairly effective in some patients with this, although there's evidence that it could grow back over time. So you have to continue to monitor those patients aggressively, but usually a combination of those two things is effective. Many electrophysiologists, myself included, would, usually, would put an ICD in somebody who had a very grossly positive uh, test of this nature. Um, and, and Dr. Pass, they would be exercise limited, restricted. Yes. Yes, you would exercise a limit a patient like this. That's right. It's one of those few disorders where a cardiologist has to tell their patient that they cannot exercise. Something that uh, goes against our, you know, just general approach to life. <laughs> Telling patients not to do something that's heart healthy. For that particular subset of patients, exercise is quite heart unhealthy for them. Um, so, although one could, aggressively beta block them and then restudy them in order to see if at moderate exercise, they can continue to exercise. If you've properly beta blocked someone, probably they should be able to moderately exercise things like walking and things of that nature. All right, guys, I appreciate your attention. Uh, I hope everybody has a great day and um, I'll see you in conference very shortly. Be well, guys. Take care. Thank you.